talking about uh, uh, here today. I'm going to be talking about uh, neutrino masses and uh, the extension that you need for the standard model. Um, it's going to be slightly math heavy in the beginning. Uh, don't worry, it's going to be just some algebra. But uh, yeah, let's, it, let's get started. So uh, first, there are three uh, representations of uh, neutrino mass. Uh, all of it is born out of the Dirac equation. Uh, I think this was covered on the first day. So uh, it can be derived uh, in this way. I'm not going to go through all of it. Basically, you use the uh, energy as uh, momentum squared plus mass squared, energy squared. Uh, here, you solve it using uh, natural units. So you have uh, C, which you know is here, but that just vanishes to 1. And you get it in this term. The idea, the reason you want to get it in this term is this is basically the Schrodinger's equation, if you can see it. This momentum uh, is gives you the kinetic energy part and the mass gives you the uh, you know scalar potential part. So this would be the total energy. This would be the Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, so here, alpha and beta are what we're you know, trying to solve for, uh, so to speak. So these need not exactly be complex numbers. Uh, these can be obviously, but yeah, in general, this is the equation that you would get. And if we combine that with, you know, the first equation that we took, the Hamiltonian system, uh, we would get this, we would get this equation. Uh, alpha plus, uh, sorry, alpha P plus beta M whole squared would give you this. And after you, you know, open the brackets and solve it, this is what you get. Now this alpha I and alpha J are basically for multiple values of alpha because you would get these answers in the form of matrices. So uh, I and J would be like, uh, sorry, you would get them in the form of like a, a vector. Um, so I and J would be the uh, component number. So this is the anti-commutative uh, property. So it's basically alpha I into alpha J plus alpha J into alpha I equals zero. You know, for normal commutative it would be minus, but for anti-commutative it would be plus. And the scalar product has to be one because the coefficient of P squared and beta squared has to be one because the coefficient of M squared. Uh, yeah. So the three rep representations are the Dirac representation, the Weil representation, and the Majorana representation, named after the three scientists. So let's see what uh, Dirac has to say about you know his own equation. So it would start. Uh, he would start by defining two four vectors, uh, sigma mu and uh, sigma covariant and contravariant ones. But all they do is basically combine something called gamma matrices into one expression. So the gamma matrices are uh, matrices that are formed uh, using the value of beta. So alpha, so beta would be gamma bar zero and alpha i, uh, you know, the alpha i, alpha j that you saw here would be the gamma bar uh, i or j. So this would be like alpha i, this would be the value of alpha i. Uh, so that's the uh, gamma matrices in general. So gamma zero would be beta uh, and gamma power five. Uh, so this is not exactly uh, power five, even though it's written in that similar way, it's basically, I times the product of the four gamma vectors. Now, why is gamma, you know, why is gamma five important? Because that gives you the chirality operator, meaning an operator that tells you whether a particle is left-handed or right-handed. And now we know what left-handed, right-handed are, right? That's the chirality. You now, if a particle is moving uh, along a direction with respect to its direction, if it's rotating clockwise, it would be right-handed. Uh, and if it's rotating anti-clockwise, it would be left-handed. So the so we have an operator for that. Uh, as you know, all of quantum mechanics does. And thus gamma five is, you know, really important. And the second one is while interpretation. And here, uh, the gamma ideas do remain the same, but there's a slight difference in the alpha, if you can see. Here is the second and the first element, but here is the first and the second. So in general, uh, you can have gamma matrices as any random matrices, as long as they, you know, anti as long as they're anti-commutative. They have to follow this property. Then you can follow any gamma matrices. That's why you can have multiple rep representations in the first place. So in the second representation, he does this. Uh, it's you. You get a different thing, but it symbolizes the same thing. Um, and the third one is the Majorana representation. So what? So what's the difference? So a Majorana uh, fermion is one that obeys the Dirac equation, like you know the previous two ones, but at the same time doesn't change under charge conjugation. So what's charge conjugation? That is an operator in normal Dirac poly and Weyl representation. That would be I times gamma squared, where you know gamma squared is, you know, just replace I with, you know, two, that would give you gamma squared. So I times gamma squared, uh, it's the same for both uh, Dirac poly as well as while, because gamma I is the same. So that would be the charge con uh, charge uh, conjugation operator. But the Majorana uh, says that the charge conjugation operator is in fact the identity matrix, meaning a charge conjugated particle 
is the same as the particle itself. Um, this this can have some serious implications. So we can start off by proving how this is the case. You can start with while, you know, you can use either of them, but we're gonna use while here. Uh, so in while representation, the charge conjugation is uh, I gamma zero where gamma zero is, you know, beta. So if you apply the representation and if you use a charge conjugation, this is what you get. Uh, here I'm saying gamma zero because uh, I'm using uh, you know Weil's conjugation, but I'm trying to derive the formula for uh, major Anna because from uh, uh, you, you'll see why that's the reason. So if you go through the you know just uh, substitute and try to open the brackets, uh, and the condition is that you know the charge operator it, it gives you the same after leading to it. So you have uh, psi two is equal to minus i sigma squared psi star one. So the normal psi operator, instead of being psi L and psi R, would be psi L and psi R would be this value, minus I sigma squared psi star L. So thus we have decoupled equations for left and right-handed state, meaning we have different equations for left-handed wave functions, uh, meaning wave functions of neutrinos which are left-handed and right-handed. So in the Dirac representation, uh, and the while representation, this would be the equations. This would be the right-handed and the left-handed part. But we have seen previously how, you know, right-handed can be written as minus I sigma squared. So in the major Majorana representation, these would be the equations. Sigma R and sigma star R. Here it would be sigma R minus sigma L, but here there's an I sigma squared in this representation. Th these are just fancy symbols that I won't really go over because if you see a general Dirac equation, this is what the equation would be. Gamma par mu is the, uh, you know, the, gamma matrix with the mu index. And that you represent in the Majorana form in this way. It's basically mu times uh, dou mu itself. But here, it's just that you express it in the form of this conjugate instead of the normal wave function. The, and that conjugate would be minus i sigma squared, you know, that conjugate. So the idea is you try to express an equation in the same handedness uh, in the hopes of achieving something. And he does achieve something. And that is the, that's what you're going to look at. So what, what's the key difference between them? Uh, I mean, we did see the key difference. You're trying to express it in a different way, but what does that actually imply? So a Majorana equation is similar to the Dirac equation in the sense that it involves four component spinners, gamma matrices, and mass terms. So here you assume Xi to be a spinner. So basically a spinner is, you could think of it as something similar to like a vector or a tensor, but it is a component that is more related to the negative rotation of a thing as opposed to its you know, uh, magnitude. For now, you, you could think of it as just a normal wave function. It doesn't really change the meaning much. So gamma matrices and mass terms, but it includes the charge component psi c of a spinner psi. So psi c wasn't there in uh, the Dirac equation, but it's there in the Majorana equation. So that's one of the key changes. Uh, and the while equation is for two component spinners without mass. I haven't included that. I've just done the Dirac equation because the whole point is mass and there's no point talking about the equation without mass. The solution to the Majorana equation can be interpreted as electrically neutral part particles that they're, that, that's their own antiparticle. So a charge conjugation is not necessarily just switching an electric charge. There are all sorts of charges. There are color charges, there are weak charges, there are weak hypercharges and all of them. So if you invert all of them, that would be, you know, calling it a charge conjugation. So if, uh, you know, you say a part, particles charge conjugation is an identity matrix. It means the charge, you know, if you invert all of those charges, then the particle remains the same. And what happens if you invert all known charges, you're going to get an antiparticle of the said particle. So what Majorana really says is that neutrinos are their own antiparticle, you know, like the, the, it's called a Majoron, like a fermion, Majorana fermion. So it's called a Majoron. So that, that, that has some very, um, deep implications. Uh, major on a spinner is its own antiparticle. Insofar as charge conjugation takes an electrically charged particle to its antiparticle with opposite charge, one must conclude that the major on a spin is electrically neutral. So if it's its own, you know, antiparticle, so you can't have a plus antiparticle having a plus charge. It has to be minus charge. So, you know, if X is equal to minus X, this is possible only if X is equal to zero. So we know that a major on has to be neutral. So, this system does not apply to any of the charged leptons, like uh, any of the charged uh, fermions for that matter. It has to be a neutral fermion and that's called a Majoron. A Majorana equation is Lorentz covariant. This is not Lorentz invariant. It means it does change under Lorentz transformation and you do get a uh, you know, corresponding matrix and a variety of Lorentz scalars can be constructed from them. This allows for several distinct 
Lagrangians. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but because we, we have seen that, you know, left and right handedness, uh, they, there is a difference. You know, it's not the same. Here, a left and right would be both incorporated in one equation, but here there are two different equations. So they have their own, uh, you know, set of laws. And so there's their own fields. So that is what the sentence is trying to say. Uh, then when the Lagrangian is expressed in terms of two component left and right chiral spinners, it may contain three distinct mass terms. Uh, here, the three distinct mass terms that, uh, okay, not there, I will show later. Uh, the one would be the normal Dirac mass term. The Dirac mass term is basically what the standard model predicts. It would be the mass of, say, a fermion, a, a, sorry, a lepton, a charged lepton, like an electron neutrino, uh, mass, the Dirac mass would be similar to that of an electron itself. That's the major, you know, problem with standard model. It can't even tell why the neutrinos are so low mass. Uh, these manifest physically as two distinct masses. This is the key for the idea of seesaw mechanism. Now, I'm going to go in depth about seesaw mechanism in a bit, and I'm going to do only type one. For describing low mass neutrinos with a left-handed coupling to the standard model. What do you mean by coupling to the standard model? Uh, coupling would be any sort of interaction, right? And the standard model has the four fundamental forces that describe the, you know, the interactions. So if you couple left-handed coupling, this means that only left-handed uh, majorons, meaning neutrinos, interact within the standard model. So only left-handed neutrinos, uh, you know, you know that, you know, only left-handed uh, neutrinos react to the weak force. So that's what that sentence says. With the right-handed component corresponding to a sterile neutrino at GUT. This is grand unified theory. You know, those scales were early universe with very high temperature with like Planck energy. And the mass of the right-handed neutrino is supposed to be this, you know, as predicted by seesaw mechanism, which I will talk about. And another is the discrete symmetries of charge, parity, and time uh, conjugation. The charges, as I said, the uh, charge, electric, weak, hypercharge, whatever. Parity would be uh, in invariance under shifting of the coordinate, coordinate system and changing it into opposite. So this would be like a left-handed being a right-handed in, in our case, but it could, in general, it's X changing to minus X. So it's like a mirror image. Uh, and time conjugation are, you know, time forward and backwards are intimately controlled by a freely chosen phase factor. Uh, this leads to CP symmetric and CP violating Lagrangians. So basically there's a, there's no, there's no, there's going to be a factor in the coming equations. I just want to build up the theory for that part. So that factor is not exactly fixed because we haven't observed, you know, uh, the key component needed to prove major on a thing. And that is the beta, uh, the neutrino less double beta decays. Those haven't been absorbed. So as of now, they are freely chosen phase factors, meaning there's a phase out uh, and they are not yet, you know, have a fixed thing. This allows for CP symmetric and CP violating Lagrangians. CP symmetric because if you have the phase factor as say pi by two, then all the signs would be, all the sign values would be one. But if you have it as cost, then all of them would be zero. So this allows for CP symmetric as well as CP violating Lagrangians. CP would be charge and parity. If you switch both of them, they are supposed to be invariant. That's what CP conversation says. The major on fields are CPT invariant, but the invariance is in a sense freer than it is for charged particles because again, charge is... Uh, zero, so you just have to worry about parity all the time. The neutral Majorana fields are not constrained in this way and can mix. That's what th this also explains neutrino oscillate oscillations and mixing through this. And or, as a bonus, it's also Lorentz invariant. So the Majorana theory of masses in the seesaw mechanism is a very, very powerful and uh, likely uh, likelihood of it existing. It's just that we haven't seen it yet. So for a massless particle, Carrelli is conserved. You know, it's like a photon. It's, it's just spinning one way. There's no, there's nothing to it. However, if, if it is, if it does have a mass, then chirality symmetry is broken because of the mass terms that I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, uh, okay so the seesaw mechanism. Uh, it's an extension of the standard model because this is not within the standard model yet. So the idea of the seesaw mechanism is basically you are going to have two different masses for a right-handed and a left-handed neutrino. And you're going to have a Dirac mass, meaning the proposed mass, which is the same of the corresponding charged lepton. So if you try to have MR minus ML very large, because, you know, we don't observe right-handed neutrinos and you can just, you know, we might say this is due to its inertness and that inertness can be explained by high mass. So, it, so thus we have a seesaw mechanism. Um, so type one, uh, this is what we're mostly going to be dealing with. And the reason we try to do this is because 
the Dirac mass comes from the Higgs field. The MD part, proposed part of the charge lepton comes from the Higgs field. That is MR or ML does not. So we are free to choose what we want. And the type one theory that we have chosen for convenience is this. So before that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the diagonalization of matrices and how to get the eigenvalue of matrix. So if you have a two by two matrix, you can express this as a diagonal matrix of the form, you know, lambda one and lambda two or lambda minus and lambda L, or lambda minus and lambda plus. So basically you're trying to express the entire A matrix in just diagonal elements. And those diagon diagonal elements are called the eigenvalues. So basically these are the possible solutions of a matrix, so to speak. So it's eigenvalues. If for a two by two matrix, this is given as the uh, the general formula, or, which is of this form: uh, b plus minus root of b squared plus four m squared by two. Because you try to get the determinant, and that determinant is zero in this case. So it it will be pretty easy to solve this. Uh, zero in this case, as in after diagonalizing, it will be zero. So the geometric mean of lambda plus and minus lambda minus equals mod m, uh, because the determinant uh, is minus m squared. Because as I said, you're going to express it only as lambda minus and lambda plus. So the determinant is just going to be m squared. Thus, if one of the eigenvalue goes up, meaning if lambda plus is very high, then automatically lambda minus go low. Or if lambda minus is high, then lambda plus goes low because the product of theirs should be a constant. Here, m is the, uh, when we go later, it's going to be the Dirac mass. So this is called the seesaw mechanism. This is the point. Like, so the m acts as a, you know, a pivot and the masses of lambda plus and minus can keep going up and down. But if one goes up, the other has to go down. That's the reason it's called the name seesaw mechanism. So you can apply this model to neutrinos. If you take B to be very, very large compared to M, then the large eigenvalue lambda plus is almost approximately equal to B because you see lambda plus, if you take plus, it's just B because this term vanishes because it's very, uh, you know, small compared to this. So you're going to have B plus B by two, which is just B. And the minus part is going to be approximately M squared by B. Okay, um, so diagonalizing a matrix. So this is, I'm just, just what I said previously, just to visualize it. This is how you're gonna get as the diagonalized matrix. Lambda one and lambda two are here, lambda minus and lambda plus. Uh, so these eigenvalues would be the possible solutions of this matrix, so to speak. Okay, so now uh, how do you diagonalize a mass matrix? Now we get to the real part. So you can assume a mass matrix is called the Majorana mass matrix uh, as comparing as ML, MR in the diagonal elements and MD being the Higgs uh, masses. You can subtract it with, uh, you can you know subtract it with plus MLI and minus MLI. So you get this out. The whole idea is because you want to get this term as zero uh, to get it in the form of what I had expressed here. So you can use the formula directly. So if you get that zero, then MR minus ML would be your B from the previous equation and MD is just your M. So after simplifying all of that, the eigenvalues, this would be lambda minus that you saw there and this would be lambda plus. So basically you just open it, you solve it. There's really not much complicated math here. It's just adding, subtracting and dividing. That, that's all this is. So seesaw mechanism, this is what you get essentially. Okay, this would be lambda uh, uh, plus and this would be the lambda minus part. So pro the propose that MR minus ML by MD to be very large, as I said. So this would be B by M would be very large. So the M1 would be M squared D divided by MR minus ML. You can see that this term would be very small. M M1 is hilariously small because MR minus ML is very big. And M2 is almost equal to MR and that's going to be very massive. So we can see that, you know, the seesaw mechanism works. So M2 is almost same as MR and M1 is almost same as ML because if you subtract the two, you're going to get MR minus ML because uh, M1 into M1 into M2 has to be M squared. If you remember from that, uh, the, the whole reason of seesaw and similarly for ML into MR. So we have M, approximately M1 is equal to ML and M2 is equal to MR. So we have the two eigenvalues of the two masses with a corresponding coherent theories. So this is a proposed thing, you know, M1 is what we've observed, the very low mass. And M2 is the sterile neutrinos. They're called sterile because we haven't seen them interact with anything yet. I mean, if they even exist. And this would be very high masses. So we have a complete corresponding theory with a mechanism to back it up. And the only thing lacking as of now is observational data. But this is a very uh, looking forward, like it's a very forward thinking in the field of particle physics. Even though this was done long ago, it's still a very, very viable theory till date. So we spoke about some, you know, uh, 
inconsistencies all you know all of these are just changes to the standard model but let's see what other you know we need to change thanks to the major anomalies and everything else the conservation of the lepton number this was first of all this came out to be as a empirical fact this was already disproved by uh, newton oscillations as you know uh, people uh, my teammates spoke about yesterday about leptonic mixing and everything so you have flavor changes so the lepton uh, number flavor is already uh, violated but we can see how this works even in the form of majorana mass and um, its extensions so first we talk about the hamiltonian uh, of the system this would be given by you know the dirac equation um i'm not going to derive this i i want to take it at face value because that's not the point of what i'm trying to do so in general you can talk about the wave function to be you know as a superposition of the l and the r field the majorana uh, wave function the spinner would be left as well as right chiral so we know the uh, we know the operators for left and right right there is one minus gamma phi by 2 and one plus gamma phi by 2 so if you if you do this and if you try to expand it into this form you can see that whenever you have a uh, a particle con uh, anti particle like the bar would be anti particle times its own would vanish because you're going to have 1 minus gamma phi squared by 2 and that's going to be zero so basically all terms with this is going to vanish when you try and open this uh, equation so you're going to have only these terms remaining so only left handed normal matter and right handed anti matter can exist so because if you have a uh, uh left handed antimatter and normal right handed matter you can see that it is it's after you go through the steps is going to be its own conjugate uh, it, it's going to sorry it's going to be the conjugate of right handed uh, anti particle as well as left handed normal particle so you can write this the equation here because we just proved that this is the conjugate of this as this plus its hermitian conjugate hc is the hermitian conjugate we just showed that it's the hermitian conjugate it's it's easier to work with one term is just seeing multiple terms everywhere would be a uh, kind of chaotic uh, so you can add stuff so the hamiltonian you can add it uh, you can add the charge conjugated part uh, of the left as well as the r fields so you're going to have left you're going to have right you're going to have charge conjugated l you're going to have conjugated right and then anti l anti right charge conjugated anti left and charge conjugated anti right there's a whole bunch of probabilities but some of them thankfully are you know cancel or they relate with each other because charge conjugated l is uh, or l whole conjugate would be the conjugate times right meaning if you have a, a left neutrino and if you try to conjugate it if you try to get the anti matter then you just have a conjugated neutrino and you which is the anti matter and you find that to be right handed so this is very very useful re relations thanks to majorana this also explains why you have only left handed uh, you know or you have right handed anti particles to be the same mass as left handed because till now you, you just said like look uh, aditya you just said you know left and right uh, sorry matter and a neutrino and anti neutrino of a major one is the same so if you have left how can it also have right like won't that be very high mass but no this also answers that which is very cool um so if you can keep only the ones with opposite chiralities uh, from this equation because we see that the same chirality comes vanish keep the opposite terms uh, you get this and another useful relation would be this uh, this is a pretty easy uh, derivation which i'm going to do so now the hamiltonian if you add all these extra components left thanks to its these are the major on a field components till now was just the dirac part of it because you see the md part but now you add the major on a part of it thanks to its you know charge conjugate so this is the equation you get md uh, plus half ml times this uh, psi l conjugate uh, anti neutrino and psi l plus half mr psi r uh, an anti right hand anti neutrino versus its conjugate plus you know the hermitian conjugate of each of these terms so now we have used some of the uh, relations and the first term conserves the lepton number here md is just md there is not much changing but the second and the last terms uh violate the uh, lepton number because the uh, hamiltonian that we expressed before is just for one particle it would say just be an electron but here you clearly have two other terms which is which is no way related to this term because they have separate masses you know the flavor of this does not matter this could be electron lepton uh, electron muon tau and whatever tau whatever you have two more terms which each would have its own lepton Uh, flavor uh, 
quantum number and you're going to add that to something that was already stable before so it it is going to be violated it has to be violated so lepton number conservation can also be violated in majorana as well as neutrino oscillations uh, so what what exactly does this imply like so what if you have a random mass term appearing so this means that in normal if lepton number is conserved if you have a right and a left neutrino if you know one uh neutrino field this is delving into quantum fields a little bit so if you have a left or a right uh left or a right neutrino or a left or right anti neutrino if they annihilate they must give back their own same thing meaning if a right and left annihilate you can either give right rise to a right and a left or an anti right and, a, and an anti left but in majorana you can have an anti right you know annihilate and give rise to just a left or a right annihilate and give rise to an anti left so there is a change in uh, lepton number because this would have plus 1 because it's normal matter and this would have minus 1 because it's anti matter so this this shows the uh, uh the violation of the lepton conservation number this is what this term means because you have a right appearing out of nowhere and that would be this uh, you know taken backwards because you have an anti left and you're going to get that as a right so that's one of the extensions of standard model that majorana offers the uh, so the so observed lepton um, conservation violation and then the second one was the charge parity violation uh, here we have the charge parity and the mass hierarchy so second one would be the charge parity violation so uh, remember i told in one of the key differences of majorana that for a massless particle kyrlet is conserved but if it has mass then it's broken and i told you there's a reason well this is the reason you're going to have an extra right or a left term which out term you do have it's going to violate the chirality uh, or the parity overall the symmetry of a quantum mechanical system can be restored uh, if another approximate symmetry s can be found such that the combined symmetry remains unbroken so they thought uh, you know if parity is broken then maybe charge parity uh, is what they came up with maybe some other thing times parity would be would still be conserved because something has to be conserved people could not be like oh this is broken like you know we try to find a very comprehensive closed view of physics and for that you need some quantity conserve so this rather subtle point of hilbert space was realized shortly after the discovery of the parity violation uh, and it was proposed that the charge conjugation c which transforms a particle into its anti particle was the super was the suitable symmetry now uh, this does uh, c appear like very thorough it explains all of the parity violations but it gives rise to three new cp violations Uh, one of them would be the CKM matrix and the quarks, which is very similar to the PMNS matrix and leptonic mixing. There's going to be quark mixing as well in the CKM matrix, and even in the strong strong quark interaction due to its color charges, there also there's going to be a charge parity violation because the handedness and the color charge don't exactly go. Now I want to show a video, uh, a minute physics video of the charge parity violation. He's going to explain better than I ever can. And um, okay, I think you guys cannot hear this. One second, I will just share the single app. I not the entire screen. Uh, tell me if you guys hear this. Do you hear this? Uh, no. On the on the uh, yeah. on the floating thing, uh, the zoom floating thing, you'll have an option to share the sound. Uh, okay. Second, share uh, computer sound or something. Check. Share sound okay. Uh, now, as they do normally, at least from a physics. Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, we can. Most everyday phenomena happen equivalently in a mirror as they do normally, at least from a physics perspective. Unlike when you play a video backwards in time, where it's pretty obvious that something weird is going on, when compared with a normal video, motion in a mirrored video still looks totally physically normal, just mirrored. In fact, without outside context, there's no way to tell which was the original and which was mirrored, which is why horizontally flopped shots are used in movies all the time. In fact, as far as we know, everything in the universe governed by electromagnetism and gravity and the strong nuclear force behaves this way. If you set up two experiments that are mirror images of one another, they'll produce results that look like mirror images of each other, which presents a problem if we ever need to communicate with aliens from afar. If all physics is mirror symmetric, that would mean 
left-handed and right-handed are relative, just like up and down and forward and back. So if we were communicating with aliens and didn't have any shared reference objects, we'd have no way of explaining what we mean by left-handed and right-handed using physics. This left-right ambiguity is called the Ozma problem. And the distinction between left and right is important because Earth-based life mostly relies on sugars with right-handed symmetry and amino acids with left-handed symmetry. This isn't a physics constraint, it just as easily could have been the other way around, but the point is, the molecules in our food and our bodies do have a specific orientation, so not knowing left from right could impair intergalactic culinary relations. However, there is a solution. The weak nuclear force, which governs the decay of subatomic particles, doesn't always play nicely when mirrored. For example, when uranium nuclei beta decay, they emit mostly electrons spinning like left-handed corkscrews. But if you perform the mirror image of the experiment using a mirror image uranium nucleus, the nucleus still emits electrons spinning like left-handed corkscrews rather than right-handed as they would in a mirror. It turns out that in our universe, the mirror image of a physical process doesn't always result in the mirror image of the outcome. Uranium always decays more into left-handed electrons, no matter how you look at it. So we could tell the aliens, you know how electrons spin when uranium decays, that direction is what we call left. Which would solve the Ozma problem, except our universe has a next level Ozma problem up its sleeve. Because what if the distant aliens were made entirely of antimatter? I mean, in principle they could be, and we wouldn't know. Antimatter interacting with itself behaves exactly like matter interacting with itself. Antihydrogen has the same atomic spectrum as hydrogen, and antimatter U looks and behaves exactly like matter U, until it interacts with matter. And here's the problem. While the matter version of a uranium nucleus always decays into left-handed electrons, whether it's in a mirror or not, the antimatter version always decays into right-handed anti-electrons, whether it's in a mirror or not. So if we told the aliens, look at the beta decay of the nucleus with atomic weight 239, that's always the orientation we call left-handed. That would be wrong. For aliens made of antimatter, it would in fact be what we call right-handed. And you definitely don't want to shake either hand of an alien made of antimatter. So how can you figure out from afar whether or not a distant alien is made of antimatter? This is the Ozma problem, level 2. Essentially, antimatter is another kind of mirror we can hold up to the universe, which combined with the possibility of regular mirroring means we can't use beta decay to define left versus right. But luckily, there's a next level solution, again thanks to the weak nuclear force. Enter the Kaon, a fast decaying subatomic particle. Whether they're mirrored or not, around 20.3% of the time, kaons decay into right-handed anti-electrons, while around 20.1% of the time, slightly less often, they decay into left-handed electrons. And the key is this. If you instead take antimatter kaons, whether mirrored or not, they still decay slightly less often into left-handed electrons, rather than right-handed anti-electrons as you might expect. That is, normal kaons, whether mirrored or not, and anti-kaons, whether mirrored or not, both decay less often into left-handed electrons. And this is how distant aliens could figure out if they're made of matter or antimatter, and whether or not they're using the same concept of left and right as we are. Simply build a particle accelerator and look at the decays of neutral kaon particles. The electron-like thing that they decay into slightly less frequently is made of what we call matter, and it'll be moving in what we call a left-handed way. The universe doesn't distinguish between left and right, or matter and antimatter, for electromagnetism, for gravity, and for the strong nuclear force. But for some reason, the weak force allows us to tell the difference. This video was made with the generous support of the- Uh, okay. So I hope you guys like this act. Um, yeah. So that would be the uh, charge parity violation because, as he said, you, they are able to distinguish it in, in a mirror. So, uh, would you not call that violated? But there is uh, another thing a deeper sense of um, a conservation law called the charge parity time conservation law. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, adding another thing like how you add a charge onto parity, you add time onto charge parity. And this, so far, hasn't been proven wrong at all. But, uh, so if CP is violated uh, and CPT is not violated, this is equivalent to saying the time has been violated, right? And in fact, there's a very cool video made by Verit Veritasium on that and the link is here. I will send this later to you guys. Uh, it's, it's a good watch, but it's kind of long. It's like 10 minutes and uh, that's... Uh, I think this talk has gone on for long enough. Uh, so now the third thing of the standard model that it fails to answer is the mass hierarchy. Now the mass hierarchy is essentially the way you arrange the mass of the neutrinos, the three masses, the three mass eigenstates, one, two, and three. So this is the major on a mass matrix. I'm not going to derive this. 
uh, but yeah, just trust me, it is. The, mo- the moduli of the neutrino mass eigenvalues, the rho and the sigma, are the sigma is uh, not what we use for the gamma matrices. This is a different one. This is the CP violating major random phases. As I said, the CP violations will have phases uh, depending on the violation angle. And there are two different angles and uh, in the major uh, system. And those are the sigma, uh, those are the rho and the sigma. Uh, that you assume Basically, you assume M, M2 to be like a standard relative mass and you try to get the other two masses uh, in the form of expressing in the form of violation of the first one. And as you know, as you saw from yesterday, from the leptonic uh, mixing, this, this is the mixing matrix. This is the PMS matrix. Uh, the C would be the cos and S would be the sine and delta is the Dirac phase. You know, standard model also <laughs> occurs for CP violation and Dirac tried to do the delta, but Majorana really got up with it with rho as well as sigma. You need three uh, masses, three factors or phases for like three violations. Uh, so we consider the mass of and the mixing pattern, which explains the atmospheric neutrino results uh, by uh, the V nu to V uh, tau oscillations as the dominant mode and solves the solar neutrino problem. Um, this is a different conversion, which I'm not entirely sure of either. But basically, it assumes B. Sorry for the formatting. It it assumes uh, mu muon to tau neutrino conversions. Correspondingly, the mass split between the uh, view one, which could also be two, and three, states is determined by the atmospheric neutrino mass difference. Because we know that uh, you know neutrino uh, the atmosphere gives rise to two different neutrinos, as in a neutrino that mixes between two flavors, and similarly a solar that mixes between two flavors. So by convention, we call the solar mixing as one and two because that's where we first got it. And the atmospheric mixing, we've observed that one of them, uh, one of the mixing phases is similar to one of the solar phases. So it could be mu one or mu two, but the third, uh, uh, another mass I say is completely different. So this has to be mu three. So this is why you don't exactly know which one is the first one and which one is the second one, because you can at best calculate the squares of the masses, the difference in the squares of the masses. You can only calculate delta m squared and delta s all squared. You can't get the exact m1, m2. That's that's the entire problem with uh, any sorts of mass uh, theories of related to neutrino, whether it be Majorana, whether it would be standard model, anything. Nobody knows the exact mass eigenstates of a neutrino. It just doesn't exist. You can get only a, like an upper limit uh, or a lower limit, depending on which system you try to solve it with, but you can never get it. And this is the main problem. So in a normal mass hierarchy, you assume that the M mu three has the most mass, M three has the most mass, uh, and then M one, M two, uh, as you would assume to what one less than two less than three. But in an inverted mass, since you don't know whether you know M three is mu three is greater than or lesser than mu two or mu one because you only have the delta value, the change value, the difference value. Uh, so you assume you know M first. We know that M two is greater than M one. This is the convention that we've taken by solar uh, neutrino problems. Without a doubt. So either M3 is greater than M2 or it's lesser than M1. That, that's that, that's the only you know possible explanation for M3. So if you see the results, I think this is from the Dune experiment, and that these are the uh, delta masses that it would give you, uh, and the mixing angles of one, two, two, three. Uh, so the absolute mass scales and the three will be considered as free parameters. Remember how I told you they're not constrained under uh, anything; they are just free because as of now we don't know uh, the exact mixing angles because Majorana uh, particles aren't even confirmed yet. So the phases of those, the rho and the sigma are considered as free, whereas the delta was, you know, very much real. It's in the PMNS matrix, the delta part. Um, so yeah. Uh, so this is a mass hierarchy. This would be the normal one that I said. So we don't know the exact mass. So we don't know the difference from zero to M1 squared. So we know that the difference, the delta M squared is 7 into 10 power minus 5. So we are assuming M1, M2 squared minus M1 squared would be 7 into 10 power minus 5. And we assume the difference between uh, one of them uh, of the solar and atmospheric to be 2 into 10 power minus 3, the M3 squared. This is an elect- electron volt squared because it's M squared and M would be electron volts in natural units. Now, what if it were inverted? What if the atmospheric one were very light? And this is what you would get instead. Then M3 would be very low and followed by M1, followed by M2. So this would be an inverted state, this would be a normal state. And you can see that oscillations are very real because the composite parts of M1 would be a fraction of mu, mu, mu and mu tau. And for the atmospheric one, it's mostly just mu, mu and mu tau, but a very little new electron that you know has been proposed or detected. So how would you dif- differentiate between them? Like, I mean, look, you look at your 
uh, detector and you say, oh, oh, well, okay, this is uh, M1. For all we know, it could be from solar, it, it could be from um, atmosphere, it could be high mass, it could be low mass. You, you, It's a very vague thing. So one way on trying to find out at least, you know, if not the absolute value, at, at least which is the correct model. We have two models, the normal and the inverted. These are just... Uh, conventions this could have been normal for all we know but since we first did detected solar and then we put atmosphere on top of that we take this as convention to be normal and the other one is inverted so the major source of experimental verification that we could have for the major uh, mass the seesaw mechanism and the mass hierarchy problem would be a neutrino less double beta decay as the name suggests there, there should be a double beta decay where a neutrino should not be absorbed it should not be observed so if that happens, what can we say? Uh, so from that experiment, this would be the mass of the beta, the double beta, beta, beta that's being released. So if it lies anywhere within this range, then we can say that the lightest neutrino out of that, meaning if it were atmospheric, then M1, uh, sorry, if it were atmospheric, then M3, and if it were solar, M1, then that would lie in this range. And if it were... Uh, you know, any heavier than this, if it were the, in the mass of this, then it would be an inverted uh, head should be hierarchy. It would be an in, inverted hierarchy. So a normal hierarchy is what we credited. That would be like, you know, this. Uh, the graph would go like this, but an inverted one would go like this. It goes up this way. Uh, you, you, you know that if it's inverted, you, you still don't get a lighter, you know, like a lower mass limit for the thing at all. So this is why they say there's a, like a specific mass limit for normal hierarchy, but not for inverted hierarchy. So a neutrino, observing a neutrino less but double de beta decay would give us so much more information, confirmation of our theories, verification, and further information on how to go about trying to solve more problems. Because if you have at least have the lower limit, you can try to get in major on mass and estimate where the other upper limit right-handed counterpart would be and try to search for that in that mass range. So a neutrino less but double beta decay is probably the most anticipated uh, observation in uh, Newton of physics, I would say. So this, uh, let's go, we've seen some inconsistency in the standard model, we've seen how neutrinos get mass. So now let's see about what we could think of if some of them were proved to be right or wrong. So one of them is supersymmetry. Uh, so supersymmetry is a theory that I bet everyone here would have heard, heard of. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a extension of the standard model. It's pro it proposes that every particle in the standard model has a super part partner, like a lepton would have a slepton and uh, like that. So the right-handed, you know, neutrino could just be like a supersymmetric part of the left-handed one, for example. That could be like a theory. Or if you if uh, you know if it's its own antiparticle, like a major on a thing is right, then the right-handed and the left-handed neutrino are the same neutrino, but we just observe the <laughs> We, we just don't observe the super symmetric brothers of it, uh, counterparts of it. So like the sterile neutrinos, like the heavier neutrinos, the uh, M, uh, the eigenstate, the positive eigenstate, that M2 uh, eigenvalue for the major on mixing thing, if you guys remember, that could be the super symmetric counterpart of the L. So maybe we have found, you know, neutrino, right-handed neutrinos, but it's, but we just call them anti-neutrinos, but super symmetric could, you know, prove otherwise. So another one is right-handed sterile neutrinos as candidates for dark matter. Now they're called sterile because they don't interact with anything. And if they do have, you know, higher mass that the GUT level mass, uh, those could very well be candidates for dark matter because we know that, I, I mean, as of now, we know that dark matter does not interact in any means whatsoever except gravitationally. So a sterile neutrino would be a very good, you know, candidate for it because it's heavy it doesn't interact with anything. And because it's heavy, it could be dark matter. You never know. And the cosmic neutrino background. This isn't exactly so much so as any of the standard model failures or possible thoughts. This is just a very uh, open-ended or a very theorized thing in the field of neutrino astronomy. Uh, it's the fact that uh, we have the cosmic microwave background, right? That we have predicted that to be uh, what uh, about few hundred thousand years after the universe has been born. The reason why we can't get an earlier image is that the universe was so dense before that, that no photon could escape, you know, but 
uh, neutrinos, they don't interact with matter as much at all. So neutrinos could have escaped way before it. So if you do find a way to collect this information, if you do find a way to detect them, you know, currently they say it's near impossible. It's supposed to be 10 to the minus five electron volts, something like that. It, it's supposed to be very, very, uh, the high energy ones are supposed to be very low energy, <laughs> surprisingly. So it's very hard to detect. But if we do do it, then we could get an image of the universe as young as one second old. Th that is an amazing thing for the field of uh, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, just understanding the universe, it would be a great breakthrough. It has been theorized, but it has not been detected yet. That's the cosmic duty in the background. Uh, the GUT level mass confirmation could help uh, form the GUT. If you have GUT level, uh, a grand unified theory mass, then if you build physics upon you know, using that mass as a general case, then you could actually form a grand unified theory because at that scale, gravity would indeed dominate. And we've already seen that via the weak force and the major runner and see some mechanism that those heavier particles can exist. So it would be like a way to help inch closer to trying and you know mixing gravity with the quantum mechanics, the one thing that nobody has been able to do ever that would help really help form the grand unified theory and hopefully einstein would be happy and another crazy thing believe it or not the charge parity violation could even answer the matter antimatter imbalance in the universe because so far everything that we know of is you know symmetric there's equal quantities of this and equal quantities of, of the opposite of that but the charge parity violation could very well say why uh by the way, right and left are obviously just conventions. But once we stick to it, we have to stay. So um, a matter which, which is left-handed would take over uh, more of the universe because this uh, sort of violation, uh, the tendencies for decays and such would explain the stability in early universe. Uh, the neutrinos that we can get from early universe, if we can, can uh, further tell what mechanism was at play when we got this imbalance in the first place. So these are some open-ended uh, questions related to neutrinos, uh, their masses, and uh, extension of the standard model. And I hope you had a fun time. Uh, thank you. You can ask questions now if you want. Uh, yeah, guys, I'm done. Is there, uh, is there anybody you want me to go over again or? Uh, any questions, some feedback? Yeah, so Aditya, it was nice presentation. And uh, actually I understood many of the topics which I couldn't understand uh, in Wikipedia, but uh, so thanks for explaining Aditya. And uh, so does anyone have any questions or doubts or you want to say anything? You can unmute and ask now. Thank you, Sagar. And yeah, guys, uh, you can ask. Yeah, so I think nobody has any doubts. So how about uh, group two people, if you're here, you tell what was the presentation. Is there anything to improve like that? Yeah, I can ask some questions, bro. <laughs> I hope you guys didn't like get too bored with the math. I tried my best to you know keep it brief and just talk about its implications. No, dude, it was it was good. It was great talk. Okay. okay. Mm.